Hi guys, I'm back again to with another reaction video and today we're reacting to seeing Muhammad and each other Leslie Hazelton. I got this request um, in the comment section so I was um, I wanted to check this out. I don't know what it will be about. It is it on TED Talk. Oh my god, I cannot speak today. But anyways, before we start, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Click that bell button to get notified whenever I do upload a video. Anyways, guys, let's check this out. It's been a while since I listened to a TED Talk, actually. When you're deeply focused on your work, you forget how it looks to others. Unless, like me, you're an agnostic Jew. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh, agnostic and Jew? Is that a thing? Agnostic Jew? Or maybe she is from a Jewish background, but she is agnostic now. So is that what you call agnostic Jew? I'm not sure. What you're deeply focused on is Islam. <gasps> and you've just finished writing a biography of Muhammad. Oh, wow. And your audience might be just a little bit nervous. <laughs> this photo was taken this past summer at the Sheikh Zayed Grand Mosque in Abu Dhabi. And yes, that's me in the middle. Mm -hmm. I never imagined myself in an abaya, but it was required for entrance. So I reminded myself that clothes do not make the woman. And took a deep breath. Oh. There was no bolt from the blue. In fact, it felt almost elegant. And since the mask is very beautiful, I posted the photo online, only to find that some of the reactions were kind of puzzling. There were Muslims saying basically, Yay, you've become a Muslim! And then there were Jews saying basically, Oi, you've become a Muslim! Oi. <laughs> This seemed a rather large conclusion to draw from a snapshot. So the I know, photo... right? Like people should know that some people require dress codes, you know? Like even if you go to temples, you cannot wear shorts uh, or revealing, how do you call this, uh, clothing. And so is also a mosque. And even church, some churches also. So people should know by now, right? Evidently invites interpretation. And the question is why? What were the underlying assumptions here? If well, I were to put this on right now, for instance. Is this an act of honor? Or is it one of disrespect? I feel like... Is it a gesture of sympathy? Or is it merely presumptuous? Or does it make no difference what I say at this moment? Because all... For me, I feel like it's a sign of respect. Not this, but it is a sign of respect. Because it's like going to someone's house. And if they have a culture or have traditions, you have to abide. You cannot just go to someone's house and then feel free and do whatever it is that you do usually like in asians asian houses you have to remove your shoes before you enter and so on and so forth so when it comes to religion tradition culture we always have to like go abide by their culture tradition and religion as well so it should be like a universal rule that even if she is not a muslim and she wants to put a scarf on it's okay as long as she's like either it's her choice or she's going with the respecting the customs of the religion or traditional culture do i even make sense probably what you not. focus on is the fact that i'm wearing an islamic headscarf in which case why is it so distracting right how this is seen has little to do with me it's a function of your preconceptions and expectations and of the agenda that you then attribute to me. And that's a loaded word, agenda. Agenda. It implies ulterior Is motives. This all the volume we got. In which case, let's look at my motives. 
To the question of how come I decided to write about Muhammad, my immediate answer is, how not? We're talking about one of the most influential figures of all time. A man who radically changed his world and is still changing ours. So how can so many of us know so little about him? Mm -hmm. How come just the idea of writing about him seems to be fraught with tension? I didn't even know a lot of things. Welcome to my Until territory. Reaction. The vast and volatile arena in which politics and religion intersect. Consider the renewed atmosphere of distrust and bitterness this past summer, for instance, when a noxious little YouTube video caricaturing Muhammad sparked protests leading to dozens of deaths. Oh my gosh, really? There were any number of agendas involved here. I didn't know this. None of them good. That of the small-minded bigots who made the video in the first place. Small-minded bigots being a redundant phrase, if ever there was one. <laughs> um... Of the Saudi That's the thing I, I, I don't understand about people. You can be a Muslim, you can be a Christian, you can be a Jew, you can be whatever. But if you have a close minded, I can never understand people like that. Like, I get a lot of rea uh, comments like, oh, you're reacting to Islamic thing because you want to be famous. Oh, why are you reacting to Muslim? That's religion is... Da -da -da. Why are you reacting... I am reacting because I want to learn. I want to broaden my mind. I don't want to be an idiot like you sitting on the computer being so naive and ignorant. That is why I'm doing reactions. It's not because I want to be famous. If I wanted to be famous, I'm not going to sit here and watch a video because that's not going to lead you nowhere. So, I like the fact that she is Touching base on also ignorant bigots out there. People who create hate uh, messages or videos like she, she talked about. And uh, people are just super close-minded. Like, come on, have a life. Open your mind. That is the purpose of your living. Is to broaden your mind. Learn from others. Learn from different people. Culture, nationality, religion, especially. Finance oh, TV station in Cairo that picked it up and made a big show of it, thus ensuring that while maybe 30 people had seen it before, now millions would. I haven't seen it though. Of the once reputable news magazine trying to revive its fading readership by implying that all Muslims worldwide were rioting in the streets, as opposed to a few hundred extremists and often just a few dozen. Yeah, it's always like that it's with media. It's amazing what you can do by cropping a photograph. Mm. There is the leader of Hezbollah, under attack for his support of the Syrian regime's brutal war against his own citizens, trying to redeem himself as a defender of Islam. And the Pakistan Minister of Railroads, trying to hide his corruption and ineptitude by offering a $100,000 bounty. Oh, wow. And the usual American Islamophobes, putting up crude us and them posters in the New York and DC subways. So many people jumping on the bandwagon. Mm. Where was Muhammad himself in all this? Where was the man who listened to the Quran telling him, and by extension all Muslims, to pay no attention to taunts and mockery? Ignore them, it keeps saying. Let them be. Turn your face away. Or in the words of Jesus, turn the other cheek. While Muhammad has certainly been distorted by his, by his detractors, he sometimes seems to have been equally distorted by the loudest of his self-proclaimed defenders, which makes it all the more urgent that we know who he really was. Yet the millions, if not billions, of words that have been written about him often seem to obscure as much as they reveal the more of them I ploughed through, the more it felt as though he were being weighed down by the sheer accumulated mass of them. What I wanted was a real feel for the man himself. Mm. I wanted the vitality and complexity of a full life lived. I wanted, in short, to see Muhammad whole. And this meant steering clear of a virtual minefield of agendas, including I'm so intrigued. piety How? and sentiment, 
and stereotype. And or maybe when when she says I want to see Muhammad, maybe she was she's talking about not him physically because obviously the time the times right maybe when she talks about i want to see muhammad she's talking about his his teachings not really him physically so that's what i'm getting because i'm really baffled like how is she going to see muhammad right how but uh maybe this could be a metaphor for something let's see judgmentalism so even as the hundreds of research volumes piled up on my floor, my most valuable research tool may have been this one-word reminder pinned beside my desk. Think. Think. Take the pivotal moment of Islam, for instance, which is what happened to, to Muhammad one night in the year 610 on a mountain just outside Mecca. He'd gone up there, it seems, in the hope of perhaps a quiet moment of insight. The last thing he expected was the blinding weight of revelation. So what struck me in the earliest account we have of that night was not even so much what happened as what did not happen. Mm. Muhammad did not come floating off the mountain as though walking on air. He did not run down shouting hallelujah and bless the Lord. He did not radiate light and joy. There were no choirs of angels, no music of the spheres, no elation, no ecstasy, no golden aura surrounding him. Not even the whole of the Quran fully revealed, but only five brief verses. Oh. In short, he did none of the things that might make it easy to cry foul, to put down the whole account as an invention, a cover for something as mundane as personal ambition. Quite the opposite. In his own reported words, he was convinced at first that what had happened couldn't have been real. At best, he thought it had to have been a, a, a hallucination, his own mind working against him. At worst, possession, and he'd been seized by an evil jinn, a spirit out to deceive him, even crush the life out of him. In fact, his first instinct was to leap off the highest cliff, and escape the terror of what he'd experienced by putting an end to all experience. Whether you believe the words he heard that night came from inside himself or from outside, it seems absolutely clear that Muhammad did experience them, and that he did so with a force that would transform himself, his sense of himself and his world. So that initial panicked disorientation, that sundering of everything familiar, that feeling of being overwhelmed by force larger than anything the mind can comprehend, strikes me as utterly real. It's the only response that makes sense. It's the only sane response. Very the only true. human one. Yeah, because sometimes like we this we describe things so extra we always say oh the angels came down with the halo and da 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 like we make it so dramatic but that description is so real because when you are in shock you're just like fudge you know like comparing to let's say a movie the way that they describe something compared to somebody real experience this is over exaggerated the movies let's say or the fake things are over exaggerated and the real things are not as beautiful as as it seems when it happens realistically so makes sense and this is what allowed me to begin to see muhammad not as a symbol and not even as a subject but as a man mm -hmm. a, a, a complex a real person. human being yeah and to follow the extraordinary arc of his life from neglected orphan to acclaimed leader, from marginalized outsider to the ultimate insider, from powerlessness to power. One thing I knew from the beginning, however, if I was to do justice to this remarkable story, if I was to bring it alive on the page, it had to be written in good faith. 
Now, I do realize there may be a certain irony in an agnostic standing here talking about good faith, mm -hmm. but there's been so much bad faith in every sense of the two. And we have to get beyond it. As long as she's an agnostic with good faith, that's good. Like, you can be whatever you, you want to be, but just have that good in you and respect people who are different from you. Because sometimes there's people who are agnostic, but then they're hating and they're negative. It's like, you're not helping yourself and anyone else. So, she's coming from a good um, place. All of us, whether we're secular or religious, mm. theist or atheist or anywhere in between, we are all impacted by the words and actions of extremists. What happens in one tiny corner of the world now reverberates globally. But whether we live in Tehran or in Tel Aviv, in New York or in New Delhi, we do have a choice. We can refuse. Refuse, that is, to allow ourselves to be led by anger and suspicion. Refuse to allow ourselves to be manipulated by extremists mm -hmm. of all stripes. Refuse their narrow vision, their comic book distortions, their miserably small minds. Oh, yes, tell them. Tell them, we Lizzo, um, have Leslie. to reclaim the narrative, the full narrative, beyond stereotypes, Beyond snap judgments, beyond headscarves. Just as we need to see Muhammad whole, so we need to start seeing each other whole. Mm. In good faith. Thank you. I feel like she embodies everything that I believe in. Not maybe everything, but uh, whatever she spoke about is how I see it as well. Oh my God, she's amazing. I love people like that. Like even if they are not born in this race or this religion or they didn't, you know, are not in this religion or this traditional culture, they still embrace and that is what we each need, is to embrace each other despite the differences. So anyways, guys, let me know what you think. If you like this video, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Leave in the comment section down below what other videos you like me to react to. The original link of this video will be in the description box down below. So that's my social media link. So guys, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.